Your body is one of your best guides. You see, your body holds on to emotion. Your body hangs on to unresolved feelings. Your body fires up or it shuts down. Evolving means learning to listen to the signals your body tells you, and then also adapting to its needs, in addition to doing the things that are going to meet your goals. Just over a year ago, I met today's guest, and he took me through an assessment process. Uh, and then over the course of several months, worked with me to reactivate some muscles that were shut down and not working. And you may be saying to yourself, well, wait a minute, Steve, what do you mean that he worked on muscles that were shut down and not working? Well, you see, the body is an amazing uh, machine. It uh, generates movement. That's what it does to get you from one place to another, to bend over to pick something up, to put that coffee cup up to your mouth. It's amazing at generating movement. But when some muscles are too tight, too loose, too painful, the body will still create movement, but it might do it in a dysfunctional way. Learning how to move properly means that you have to get muscles and movement patterns working correctly so that you can move and be healthy for life. And today's guest is going to teach you how. Welcome to the Evolve Podcast. Evolve your body, evolve your mind, evolve your soul, and evolve your tribe. And now it's time to disrupt. And with that, folks, we want to welcome you to another episode of the Evolve Podcast. Joining me from Oberlin, Ohio, where you've got a lot less snow today than we do, Miles. The most interesting man that I know, W. Miles Riley. Welcome. It was a, it was supposed to the weather called for a light rain. It's been a torrential downpour. Wow. <clears throat> We've had nonstop snow. Since, uh, yeah. well, all day, all night. It's been crazy. Some of the most I've that I've seen, seen all winter long. Uh, anywhere, so somewhere lost in the mountains of Utah under the snow, I am Steve Cutler. And today's guest is uh, a really special guest. I'm really excited to have him on. Dr. Eric Danielson is a doctor of chiropractic who specializes in an innovative technique of muscle activation. Having extensively studied muscles and how they relate to injury, he has become an expert in treating sports industry injuries, helping athletes of all levels achieve peak performance. Dr. Danielson's journey into chiropractic care began when he was treated for sports injuries as a student athlete. Traditional chiropractic adjustments, while effective, weren't enough to completely get him over an injury to his low back. It wasn't until he was treated with muscle activation that he was able to completely heal from this injury. After experiencing the benefits of muscle activation firsthand, he knew that he had found his calling and became dedicated to learning everything he could about the role muscles play in sports injury and how this cutting edge therapy can help athletes recover from their own injuries. Dr. Danielson attributes muscle activation to his success in treating a wide range of athletes, including bodybuilders, professional athletes, and young athletes. His approach to the body is unique not relying on the traditional chiropractic model for treatment, he considers muscles to play a much larger role in pain and dysfunction, and by focusing on activating those muscles, he provides effective, powerful, long-lasting results for his patients, and I am one of those, and I would attribute to that. Uh, Dr. Danielson, thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, thanks, Steve. I appreciate it. I'm equally as excited to be here. Yeah, we are so fortunate to have you. And, you know, I've I've been in the, I, I tell people 20 years I've been in fitness, but if we're being honest, it's closer to 25 years that I've been in the health and fitness industry. And I'm a guy that uh, I love to experiment on myself. I love to test things out. Uh, when I have uh, pain or problem, I'll try different modalities to see what works, what doesn't. I keep what does and I throw what doesn't away. I've tried a lot of different diets. I've tried a lot of different exercise programs and routines. And the ones that work, I keep going back to. And I was so excited when I started working with you and started to see some amazing results from your uh, from the process and the technique that you go through. I Tell our listeners a little bit about what this is. What is muscle activation? Yeah, great question. Um, so muscle activation, it's kind of like a buzzword, I think, in the fitness world. You hear muscle activation, you hear fitness trainers talk about, you know, are your muscles firing properly, firing patterns, right? Um, yeah. A lot to do with movement. Um, and, you know, depending on who you talk to, it can actually mean a few different things. We call it muscle activation. It's kind of a, an umbrella term. Um, but I'll kind of give you a, a quick 
brief history of where of what I do and where that comes from. Um, in the chiropractic world, there's a technique called clinical kinesiology, and it's um, uh, all based off of muscle testing and you know, basically figuring out where muscle dysfunction is. And there's a guy by the name of Dr. Um, Craig Bueller, mm-hmm. and he's actually the one that kind of took this clinical kinesiology to a whole other level and coined it AMIT, which stands for Advanced Muscle Integration Technique. And this technique, what kind of sets it apart from, um, you know, maybe what you might see from a trainer at a gym or somebody who's just kind of evaluating movement is that um, what we can do is isolate individual muscles through the body um, and test them through the range of motion and identify if muscles are able to basically hold a contraction or not. Yeah. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but for the most part, it's it's isolating a muscle, testing it under resistance. So it's a manual test. And if the muscle is unable to hold, um, then that indicates that that specific muscle is not firing. Um, and so for myself, I don't, don't technically, I'm not technically certified in this AMIT per se, but the technique that we do is all, it's kind of a conglomeration of that and a couple other things, but it's, it's rooted in that clinical kinesiology, um, AMIT uh, technique. But the whole idea here is, yeah, if you have, if you're experiencing pain with movement, um, kind of like what you were saying in your intro, pain with movement, or uh, let's say you've got asymmetric muscle weakness, um, and that could be an indication that your body is not sending signals to the correct muscles in order to perform those movements. And so um, activating the muscle basically entails um, working with the muscle attachment points. So uh, a muscle runs from a point A to a point B. So you think about your bicep, it kind of connects up into your shoulder, right? right? And then it spans a length down your whole arm into your forearm. And when it contracts, you're able to bend your elbow, Right. Um, and so by activating a muscle, we work on, you know, it'd be that point in the forearm and also that point in the shoulder, the two attachments, it's called the origin and the insertion. Um, and then also incorporating some acupuncture principles, working through energy acupuncture points in order to kind of restore a full healing to that muscle. So talk a little bit about how muscles work, because we talk about firing or that they're not firing correctly. What do we mean when we're using those words? Yeah, so muscles do two primary things. Um, number one, we they move our bodies, right? So yeah. just kind of what we were talking about. Uh, the second aspect of muscles is that they stabilize our joints. Um, the stabilization factor for muscles, I think, gets overlooked because we have we have ligaments that stabilize our joints too, right? In our ankles, our hips, we've got a very vast network of ligaments that keeps our joints together. Um, but muscles, as they surround the joints, they play uh, as important or a more important role in stabilizing a joint as well. And so um, when it comes to muscles and what, what they're doing and, and, and muscles that are, are not firing, um, let's say, for example, uh, let's take an athlete who's uh, playing basketball or playing football. And when you cut as an athlete, that sudden change in direction, your your brain has to send a ton of information to those muscles in order to control the movement and then also to stabilize that joint. Um, if you have a quad or multiple of your quad muscles not firing when you cut, what happens then is that you put more strain on ligaments. So your muscles are kind of your first line of defense for that stabilizing. But if those aren't working and that signal from your brain doesn't go to that muscle when you make that movement, um, then that's where you get an ACL tear, right? Or, yeah, or an MCL yeah. tear where you cut the muscles don't give that resistance or that stability and your, your knee keeps going and then, and then the ligament tears, right? So that's kind of one pretty easy, um, example, I think to kind of wrap your head around, but that's, that's the biggest thing is that when you, when you make a movement, your muscle needs to react instantly. If it's, a, if it's delayed by half a second or, if, you know, or longer, then that can be detrimental and can cause a, a pretty serious injury. That was the most powerful visual um, I had ever heard of, even being an ex-personal trainer. And that I, I, it just, all of a sudden, a list of injuries that I've heard across all sports and athletes just came to mind. Yeah. That that the muscle, if a muscle's not firing properly, the next thing that will try to fire is the ligament. 
And so it makes the ligament more vulnerable. I have never heard it framed like that. Yeah, and ligaments, they don't have the capacity to handle the type of load that we put on our bodies, right? So exactly. you think about a bodybuilder who's, who's putting up 600 pounds on a bench press, um, your labrum in your shoulder or a ligament in the shoulder is not going to be able to withstand that force whatsoever. So it's all muscle. Yeah. And again, if that muscle gives out, um, then either other muscles then have to kind of come and, and, and take over or yeah, or that force goes to that ligament. And if your body is not good at, um, kind of compensating for those movements, then, um, then you're going to get an injury. Some people are actually quite good at compensating, uh, for lack of stability and are able to avoid injury maybe more than others. But, uh, for a lot of people that compensation does just doesn't happen quite right. And, and yeah, and then that's where our injuries can come from. So the firing of the muscle is is really the the brain is the head of the central nervous system. Uh, the central nervous system communicates with the peripheral ner- nervous system, which literally sends a firing type signal. Imagine if your car, you have a spark plug in, plug in your car, sends a signal to the muscle to say work, and then that, like you're saying, if it works, great, you've got a stable joint. If it doesn't, well, you're in trouble because ligaments. Yeah. Let's face it, the ligament is not as flexible and it's not as strong. There's not enough elasticity in the in the ligament and then not enough strength to stabilize a joint. I love how you talk about the muscles really have those two main functions, right? There's a tonic function to it and there's a phasic function. The phasic is let's get you in moving. The tonic is let's keep you stable. Um, talk about when you are going through this testing process, how you're identifying which muscles are weak. Yeah. So this is a little bit where um, it's kind of more complicated. Whereas we're testing a muscle, um, there's a big difference between a weak muscle and a, and a, and a not firing muscle. So uh, an example of this, if I'm testing a bodybuilder who can, who can put up a lot of weight, they're strong, right? Yep. Um, if I'm testing, I've tested, you know, 80 year old frail women who obviously don't have a lot of muscle tone, but I might find a whole lot more muscles actually not firing in the bodybuilder than I would maybe in the 80 year old weak woman. Right. Yeah, so there's a yeah. huge difference between weak and firing. And that's something I think people don't quite understand. Great point. Um, but the firing aspect is really the muscle's ability to adapt to load. If we can kind of think of it in that way. So um, we like to think of a muscle that's firing as, or not firing as, on or off like a light switch. It's not quite like that. Um, you know, a muscle has, um, you know, has a nerve going to it, right? It has blood flow, it has support. So muscles, when they shut down, it's not a light switch. It doesn't just completely turn off. Um, we call it passive activation where the muscle does still work. You could still move your arm, for example. Um, but when the muscle has to adapt and react to load, that's kind of the portion that's not fully working. And that aspect of it is more with proprioception. I don't know if you're familiar with proprioception, uh, but just to kind of give a quick quick rundown on that, when you close your eyes, um, you're able to reach down and touch your big toe or your kneecap, right? You don't really need to look at it to yeah. know where exactly it is. So proprioception is your body's spatial awareness. Uh, your brain keeps track of muscles and organs that same way. It has proprioceptive feedback to everything. And when a muscle shuts down, it doesn't have that proprioceptive feedback from the brain. And so it does still have a nerve. It does still have um, function to an extent, but its ability to adapt to load is really what uh, where the issue is. And so kind of back to your question, when we're testing a muscle, um, what we're trying to do is, first of all, place the body in a, in a position that um, isolates, isolates the muscle. So muscle fibers run in all sorts of different directions. And let's say we're testing an arm and we have the arm straight out, out to our side. Uh, we might be having activation of, of, of multiple muscles are part of our deltoid. We might have all, all parts of our deltoid firing. We might have our, our part of our rotator cuff firing, but if we orient our arm in a very specific direction, then we isolate those muscle fibers to basically make sure that those muscle fibers are the main fibers that are contracting when we pull or when we test that muscle. And so uh, in the case of a shoulder, we'd use the arm like a lever. So we'd contact the, the end of the forearm and we'd pull that 
arm through the range of motion that, that, that those muscle fibers, if contracted, would bring that muscle into that range of motion, but we pull in the opposite direction. So for example, if, if I'm bringing my arm up, is that, if that's the action of the muscle, I'm pushing the arm down to test it. Yeah. Okay. And what I'm feeling for again, kind of that weak and, and firing um, point of things is that if a muscle is firing, what I should feel is that muscle lock. There's a, there's a very definitive feeling of that muscle is able to hold that contraction. And then when I feel that I add a little bit more force to it to see if that muscle can also adapt to my force. Mm. And so it's kind of those two things where if a muscle is just weak, I could just put some pressure into it and I could overpower any muscle in the body, right? When we're isolating muscles, individual muscles, there are some muscles that are very strong in isolation, but a lot of muscles are not super strong in isolation. When we work out, we don't work out in isolation, right? We're always using right. groups of muscles. We train with groups of muscles. We don't usually train in isolation, but when we're testing, an isolated muscle is relatively weak. And so what we're feeling for is that just, just that subtle locking mechanism of that muscle. And if I put a little bit more force into that, if that muscle can continue to adapt and continue to hold through that. And if that muscle doesn't lock, it's pretty obvious that and as I add more force, I'm able to very easily um, take that arm or the leg or whatever muscle I'm I'm testing and push it in the direction that that muscle is going. And that's a pretty strong indication that a muscle is not firing. Uh, and then oftentimes I'll compare to the other side too, because um, if if somebody does have an asymmetric injury, so one shoulder's hurt while the other one's totally fine, that opposite side muscle should be should be working fine. And so we can we can pretty easily compare the two and. And a patient can see, oh yeah, like I have no problem holding this this test up on this side, but uh, on my right side, there's no way I can I can even hold it. Patients will even say too, when we test the muscle, I'll put them into a position and they'll say, yeah, this isn't going to happen. <laughs> and so it's it's a vulnerable position for their body. They get into this position, they say, yeah, I don't I don't feel good in this position. I don't even know how to hold myself in this position. You're pushing. Yep. I don't even know which direction to to resist in. Because yeah, there's no my orientation, brain there's no proprioception. Can't, can't figure out. Yeah, there's no proprioception there. there. Your brain can't quite figure out how exactly to even hold that position. And then they're pretty amazed that once we activate the muscle, um, not only can they hold strong, but but it feels easy to them. They're like, oh yeah, it's like a it's like a familiar memory. Um, it just kind of restarts that, and they're able to to hold that no problem. And so these individual tests that you do uh, help to isolate as much as possible uh, these the different muscles so that you can identify what is what's weak and or well not necessarily weak what's turned off and what do we need to turn back on. Um, one of the things I thought was uh, pretty fascinating is we went through I can't remember the number of muscles that I had shut down um, I I don't know eight to twelve somewhere in that range I, I want to say. Um, yeah some smaller, some bigger. Um, and one of the things I noticed is like, uh, as I'm doing a bench press or like a dumbbell bench press, right? I could keep relatively the same amount of weight, but what was happening is at some point, my uh, pec muscles had shut down and were not firing properly. And so I could still lift about the same, but I was getting a lot more pressure into my shoulder joint and I was feeling it more in my arms as I was doing this. And I wasn't getting the same feeling in my pec. And so when we did the, uh, the activation on the, uh, the pectoral muscles, uh, the next session, I think I texted you afterwards. Uh, I was like, dude, this, that was awesome. Like it felt amazing how alive that muscle became after doing that. So walk our listeners through after you've identified and you've gone through the assessment and said, okay, we've got this muscle that's shut down and you make a list of all the different things that are shut down. What's next? Yeah. So I love working on people like you or anybody who's active or who goes to the gym, because that's, that's the most common, the most common thing that people will experience, right? They'll, yeah, yeah. they notice something feels off or feels wrong in the gym. And, um, and we kind of talked about how, you know, everybody's bodies are different at compensating. So yeah. you'll get people just like you with the same muscle shut down with different symptoms because mm -hmm. their body's going to compensate differently. So for me, for example, I had a pet shut down not too long ago. And my symptom was that my left side fatigued way faster than my oh, right interesting. side. Huh. Um, for some people, they feel it more in the joint. 
you're going to feel yeah. the pain wherever your body is trying to figure out how to compensate, right? Some people just aren't good compensators at all. And so they just get a lot of pain or they just have a ton of weakness. But yeah. people who have been working out for a long time or maybe who have worked through injuries will figure out how exactly um, to push through and to still get the same power output, but, but by utilizing different muscle groups. It's we're we're kind of gluttons for punishment, aren't we? There's, there's a, oh, yeah. there's a, it's a psychological problem, I think. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. Uh, athletes, a lot of them are hard headed. You don't want to take time off. Right. So if you've got yeah, an injury, yeah. if you feel imbalanced, you just, figure, you just figure out how to get around it. Right. Exactly. Um, so yeah. So after we, after we, identify which muscles exactly are, are shut down. Uh, then that's where the process of activating the muscle comes into. And so, um, and that's where, you know, it takes typically about 15 minutes just to activate one muscle, 10 to 15 minutes, depending on the size of the muscle. Uh, and it's all about stimulating those proprioceptive nerve endings. So I kind of briefly explained that we're going to, we're going to work on the origin and the insertion of a muscle. Um, now, the only reason why that's the area is because where that muscle connects into bone is called in thesis. Um, that's mm -hmm. the muscle bone connection. It's called the enthesis of a muscle. Um, most people don't talk about that area of a muscle, but that's where, that's where most of your proprioceptive fibers are. Also throughout the entire tendon, um, that's where, that's where those fibers live. Um, to kind of give you a visual, when you, if you were to do like a bicep curl, and this is kind of going back a little bit to uh, muscle shutting down and how the neurology works a little bit. Um, if you were to try to curl a hundred pound dumbbell, um, most of us can't do that. And it's not necessarily because the weight is too heavy. Right. Uh, it is to an extent, but it's because the brain tells the muscle that, hey, uh, this is dangerous. We're gonna, we're not gonna allow this muscle to fire its full capacity because there's too much tension yeah. on this in this list. Right. And so, um, that's kind of a very temporary feedback loop of your brain saying nope to the muscle and shutting it down uh, to an extent so that it decreases tension so that it doesn't tear. Um, and so those fibers and those receptors that communicate with the brain and tell the brain what to do in those situations, those all live in the tendons and, and where that tendon attaches to the bone. And so that's where I'd say the magic happens mostly is when uh, we work and we stimulate those areas pretty deep and make sure that those nerve endings are able to, you know, for lack of a better word, wake up, right? We're waking up those so that your yeah. brain can then yeah. send that signal to, to the muscle. Um, now, there's an interesting thing that happens, though, with chronic injury. If muscles have been shut down for a long time, um, that simple activation process of just working on that origin and the insertion uh, for whatever reason, typically isn't quite enough to get these muscles fully working. Mm. Um, sometimes we'll just get a very temporary activation. So the muscle will work temporarily, um, and then it will usually shut down after a couple of days um, of me working on it. And so that's where um, part of the treatment comes in utilizing principles of acupuncture. So the guy who discovered this technique was, kind of, was finding that same issue where um, he was working on muscles, but muscles weren't holding. So patients kept coming back um, and kept having muscles worked on over and over again and and being frustrated without, you know, not getting lasting results. Um, he had to keep looking, right? And so that's where he, he decided to look into acupuncture, trained in acupuncture and found very specific um, acupuncture points along uh, what's called your meridian system that relate to specific muscles. Um, so the meridian system is what an acupuncturist treats. Acupuncture is typically used for well, a, a wide variety of, of issues from internal organs stuff to, you know, digestive to stress, anxiety, um, you name it. An acupuncturist can find a point that relates to a symptom. Yeah. Um, but these points can also relate to specific muscles. And so um, all along that meridian system, and then also there's some principles in, in kind of organ reflexology, too by connecting into energy points that have been mapped out for thousands of years, but by connecting these points in a specific order, we're able to kind of close a circuit and, and, and ensure that this muscle is able to go through a full process of healing so that it continues to work. And so the thing that kind of sets us apart, I would say from um, maybe other, other chiropractors for sure, but other people who do soft tissue and manual therapy work is that typically the results are long lasting. Um, 
And so when I activate a muscle or when any of us who know the techniques activate muscles, they're supposed to stay working. They're not supposed to shut down soon after we, we work on them. Um, now the thing that shuts them down is injury to kind of begin with, but, um, you know, as long as injury and overload doesn't happen, these muscles shouldn't just shut down on their own. They'll keep working as long as you're loading them and making sure that you're training them properly. Yeah. A few things I want to unpack there. Um, it, it's pretty fascinating that when you, when you observe a result that maybe the result's not as long lasting and you dig a little bit deeper and say, well, what else is there? And so tapping into the acupuncture points, uh, hitting some of those meridian points, I think is uh, pretty fascinating. And and ultimately, that's what the scientific process is, right? We put a hypothesis together, we test it. If it works, great. We, we've proved the hypothesis. If it didn't, then we go back to the drawing board and we try it again. Uh, the meridian points. Uh, this was something I was introduced to uh, a couple of decades ago. And it's interesting in allopathic medicine, Western medicine, People look at that and they say, well, there's nothing to it. But the reality is the meridian points, if you were to take a meridian map of the body and you overlay that to the nervous pathway that we have uh, in Western medicine, they're almost identical. And what I've found from uh, acupuncture, uh, meridian points, certain types of massage, and especially with the work that you do, um, there's when you activate the right way, the stuff works. I mean, just plain and simple. And so I, I always laugh when I hear uh, some Western doctors say, well, that's, you know, that's foo-foo stuff that doesn't work. Uh, well, th there, there's a reason that uh, people in China have been doing uh, acupuncture and working on meridian points for a long time. It, it, it works, it functions. So, uh, and, and I can tell you from my own experience of working with you and having you work on the meridian points and, and the origin insertion points of the muscle, it's amazing how much more of a firing we get in that muscle afterwards, as you talked about the ability to hold, but then the ability to respond to uh, the changes in pressure are, are just uh, phenomenal. So go back just a little bit, uh, uh, Dr. Danielson, to talk about why the muscles shut down. I know you said that uh, oftentimes they shut down because of an injury. But, you know, sometimes people will come into you and say, Oh, hey, I, I, you know, I'm feeling okay. But uh, yeah, let's test me out. And there might be some stuff that shut down and there was no uh, visible injury that they've experienced, so to speak. What are other reasons why the sh why the muscles might be shut down? Yeah, and that actually happens quite often. Um, my favorite patient is somebody who has a specific injury that happened that we can pinpoint, you know, I was feeling great before the injury and then this happened and now I have pain. Um, those are, you know, nearly slam dunk cases for yeah. us, but yeah, you, you get a lot of people. I'd say that's honestly the majority of people come in who don't have a specific injury and they say, Hey, like, yeah, I'm feeling pretty good. I just want an overall check or I'm kind of feeling achy and nothing happened, but um, you know, let's just kind of see what's going on. So, um, yeah, ultimately, you know, life is full of trauma <laughs> uh, we yeah. call them micro traumas. So, yeah. um, so micro traumas add up to become larger traumas basically. And so, uh, the principle of overload is probably the biggest one, probably, in my opinion, one of the biggest reasons why muscles shut down over training, overloading tissue uh, without, without rest and recovery. And so, the exact mechanism of why the muscles shut down in the first place. I mean, um, ultimately kind of with that, that bicep example, the brain knows that if you lift that, that dumbbell, that's too heavy for you, that the muscle is going to tear. And so yeah. the muscle will shut down. So, um, so rapid stretch or rapid tension on a muscle. So like your classic injuries, think whiplash, right? Your head comes forward mm. and back, right? That, yeah. that rapid movement of those muscles are overly stretched the brain will send that signal to shut the muscle down because if that muscle stays tense and stays, that tone doesn't leave from that muscle, that muscle will tear. And so that's kind of the mechanism where if, as we go through and, and have these big event injuries, um, the brain recognizes that these muscles are going to tear if we don't turn off. That system's not fail, foolproof, right? Uh, people still tear a hamstring or a calf or a bicep. Yeah. Um, there are certain muscles that seem to shut down and respond to that system better. But for the most part, that's kind of the principle. Um, when it comes to overload though, there's not that specific one event that happens. It's just repetitive use over time. 
And um, the brain is going to kind of go through the same thing though, where it, it senses that there's too much load over time on this muscle. This muscle has not had time to heal and recover. So in order to protect it, it will turn that muscle off uh, so that it can start to heal. Mm. Um, so muscles though, after an injury or after overload, they are supposed to re-engage on their own. Uh, the system is not meant for muscles to shut down and stay shut down. Yeah. Uh, when you when you have an injury, I mean, a lot of how many of you, how many of us have had injuries and not had any therapy done and recovered 100 from an, from the injury, right? right? Probably most of us. Yeah. Um, and that's the way that our body is supposed to work. Our bodies are supposed to heal these injuries kind of on their own. Um, I know myself; I've had plenty and and plenty. They they just kind of get better on their own. But they don't get better when we keep training through it, right? When we keep training through the injury, they don't usually get better. Mm -hmm. um, if our diets suck, uh, if we're eating high inflammatory diets where our body's fighting inflammation throughout our system and they can't focus healing to an area. Yeah. Muscles have a harder time re-engaging if we're not having um, good sleep. Um, if we're overly stressed, which a lot of us are uh, stressed about a ton of things. So there's a lot of factors that prevent our bodies from healing and from re-engaging muscles on their own. But almost without fail with an injury, you're going to have muscles that that stop working. It's just whether or not your body's going to figure out how to take care of them on their own. Um, and so we do get a lot of people who, yeah, they don't have a ton of pain, but we find a shoulder muscle or we find a leg muscle that's not working. And because you have, I mean, in your shoulder alone, we test about 30 muscles. And mm -hmm. so, you know, 29 out of 30 is not bad, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, yeah. most likely people aren't going to have a lot of pain, uh, unless they load in a certain way. So, um, if that muscle shut down, let's just say, um, I mean, you've got three different divisions of your pec. Let's just say one division's not working, but um, how many muscles help do a press up or do a bench press? You've got a lot more than just, just your pec that does that. So right. you might still be able to do it and not notice a huge difference. Um, some people may notice a huge difference right away. And if only one division of that pec is shut down, um, but the more that you load that tissue, the more likely you are to overload the surrounding tissues that are having to support. And so um, you can kind of get this domino effect where once muscles, one muscle shuts down, more muscles get loaded and they get overloaded over time and start shutting down until um, we get we get pain basically. And your, your joint suffers, other muscles are enough to take over the load that's been lost from that muscle not working. So how do people know if they're not living in significant pain, maybe they just don't have a lot of energy, but they working out okay, you know, the workouts aren't bad, they just kind of live in that mediocre state, but they don't have pain. How do they know that they need to get tested? Why, why, what, what are some indicators that you would tell them? Yeah, so somebody's not in pain. Um, that's a good question. I mean, if you're if you're not in pain, and you're a pretty high level athlete, um, and you feel like things are working, you know, well, it's, there might not be any muscles really shut down. Mm -hmm. Um, I recommend for anybody who's an athlete though, to get things checked because, um, it's in my opinion, as good as it is for injury recovery, it's equally as important for injury prevention as well. Yeah. And so you might, you might be feeling fine, but because your body is so good at compensating, you might not really notice a huge change. Um, and so. Uh, until until an injury happens, right? And so it could have been that one muscle has shut down, uh, but then you know through training you end up getting hurt because because of an imbalance, or um, you know the injury is what causes the muscles to shut down in the first place. But I will say most people, and um, if they're fairly in tune with their body, they'll notice something just feels different. And so you kind of get this asymmetric feeling where maybe when I squat. Uh, my right hip feels really good, but there's something kind of weird with yeah. my left hip. Yeah. Um, that weirdness, some, you know, sometimes people can't quantify or quite describe exactly what that feels like, but it just kind of feels different. Um, and that could be an indication that, yeah, we should probably get something checked. Um, obviously, the more obvious things is just, you know, a true asymmetry. So you're, you're benching and, uh, well, my right arm goes up fine, but my left arm's really struggling, right? Mm -hmm. That could be an indication. Um, the other thing too, the, the telltale sign of a muscle not working is pain with movement. That is the number one um, indication that a muscle might not, not be working. Doesn't mean that 100% of the time muscles aren't working, but um, if you have a, if you have pain through a range of motion or especially pain when you load a muscle or load a joint, um, that is 
you know, you have a very, very high likelihood that something's not firing. Yeah. Um, but for just kind of your general population, I mean, I recommend people get muscles checked just because we want to stay active. We want to, we want to prevent injury. Um, and by having muscles and having that confidence that everything is working properly, that's going to um, hopefully help us you know, prevent and, and continue being active, you know, for years. It's kind of like a, if you buy a car, you get the oil changed on a regular basis, you're probably not going to have as many issues with that car, right? Same thing with your alignment. If you get your alignment done, you rotate your tires, you balance the tires out, you're going to be just fine because, um, you know, if, if you let those things go, I mean, there, there was a time where I didn't pay attention to what was happening with the alignment or the balance on my tires and I had one tire go bad and then I ended up having to replace all four because that one went bad because I didn't address the issue that was happening with the, uh, you know, the one tire, that, that asymmetry that was going on. So I love that. I, I've, uh, I, I stole this term and I'm not sure who I stole it from, but um, I remember I'll give him credit at some point, but uh, fitness hygiene and health hygiene, right? You think about hygiene, we brush our teeth, we take showers, we do those things. But from a fitness and a movement standpoint, there's this hygiene that we need to do on a regular basis. And so I love how you talk about that. Hey, you should probably get tested uh, if you're moving on a regular basis, just to make sure that you're preventing injury, because it's much easier to prevent injury than it is to, uh, you know, to recover from it. Hey guys, it's Steve. I just wanted to take a quick break and introduce you to our Evolve Your Glutes Master Course. This is our brand new course that we have loaded on our website. You can find it at evolve-cast.com. What is this? Well, this is a master course that will take you through all of the steps, the programming, the exercises, everything you need in order to build your best glutes. We make it simple and we take all of the guesswork out of building your glutes. In the Evolve Your Glutes master course, you get customized videos that show you how to set up, do the exercise properly, and prevent against injury. You see, there are a million exercises out there. It's not the exercises that get you to the glutes you want. It's the right exercises in the right order at the right time over the course of 12 weeks. Click the link in the show notes and get your Evolve Your Glutes Master Course today. And now, back to the show. Talk a little bit about some of the lifestyle factors that are causing people's muscles to shut down. Yeah, so sometimes it can come from uh, not enough movement. Um, so ultimately, the thing that keeps our muscles healthy and engaged is by using them, right? So after we activate a muscle, uh, my recommendation for that patient is to use it. So if we just work on a whole bunch of shoulder muscles, go to the gym and, and load it. We want to load. We want to send that feedback to the brain. Yeah. And so, um, so we want to make sure that we're having that. Um, that consistent feedback to to the brain for, or to the muscle from the brain. Um, but other lifestyles, I mean, one one aspect I haven't really touched on as far as muscle shutting down is um, the joint aspect of of muscle uh, muscle function. Um, so muscles, they like we were talking about before, the stability aspect is as a muscle surrounds a joint. Um, there are a lot of receptors within a joint that send feedback to muscles. Um, there's a term called arthrogenic muscle inhibition. And arthro in Latin is joint or bone. And when a joint itself is restricted in its range of motion, then the joint receptors itself aren't firing very well. And it can actually cause inactive or it can affect the activity of muscles around that joint also. Interesting. And so... So that's where, you know, you have people with like, you know, maybe who sit at a desk all the time and are hunched over uh -huh. Um, you get these, these joint, these, these joint restrictions all through the neck and the upper back. And that can actually cause muscles around those joints to stop supporting like they're supposed to. Um, oh, okay. And so that's kind of where that, that lack of movement comes in, where if, if we're not moving our bodies and we're stuck in static positions, a lot of times our joints will adapt. And they'll start to get comfortable and they will not want to move out of those positions. And that can be a detriment to the muscles around them. Um, I'll see it too in a hip, for example, where um, if I test a hip 
you know, all the muscles in the hip. And I see, you know, majority of the muscles shut down in the hip, but there was no, I mean, to shut down 10 muscles in a joint in a hip takes a significant injury. But if there's been no injury um, and all they've been doing is, you know, they sat on an airplane or they were, you know, they were inactive or maybe, maybe there was a jarring of, of the hip a little bit, but nothing that would cause that. We adjust the hip. So we, so we basically mobilize the hip, uh, which resets all the joint receptors. And then that sends feedback to muscles to start working again. Um, okay. Same thing, in, same thing in an ankle. So you sprain an ankle. Sometimes the muscles are fine. It's the joint. We adjust the joint. Um, and by adjust, we just mean by, by, gapping the joint to allow movement in the joint, which fires their joint receptors again. And those muscles will start to come on around the joint too. Um, and so lifestyle wise, yeah, if we're not moving enough, our joints get compromised. Um, joint or movement is the key to keeping our joints healthy. So um, if you have arthritis, you know, degeneration in a joint, uh, the best thing for you is to move the joint. Um, and so that plays a huge role in keeping muscles working. Now, sometimes it's not enough just to mobilize the joint to get the muscles working. Sometimes there can be additional patterns that we actually do need to activate the muscle as well as mobilize the joint. But um, sometimes this can be a cascade of events that starts just from, from a joint. Um, but muscles are made to are move, people. right? I mean, muscles are made yeah, to move. Right. Hey, we, we function best when we're moving. Uh, they're not meant right. to just sit on or lay on. Right. <laughs> I love that. Right. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we, we, uh, unfortunately our society, you know, we don't move nearly enough. And right. sometimes that 20 minute workout a day is not enough to, I mean, we sit for 10 hours a day, but then we move for 20 minutes. It's not yeah. that balance isn't quite there. Right. Yeah. Movement exactly. throughout the day. I always, I always tell my patients, if you sit at the desk, we'll stand, stand half, you know, yeah. take, take 15 minutes out of the hour, maybe to stand yeah. or walk around, take breaks and change position. We're not static. We're not static beings. We're meant to be dynamic, moving, yeah. uh, keeping our joints, our muscles healthy like that. Um, and the other demographic that, that I'll see sometimes is are people who are just prone to overtraining. Um, like I had a high school student athlete not too long ago who he went to the gym and worked out two days a week or two times a day, sorry, two times a day, six days a week. Wow. Um, and you can imagine the overload that he put on his body and he wow, had boy. more muscles shut down. Yeah, he had more muscles shut down than I've almost ever seen. And it was just because of overtraining. Mm. And so, you know, we do need to be mindful of taking rest and recovery days with our training. Yeah. Uh, that's how our muscles recover. When we, when we lift, um, I'd be willing to bet if you did a, a really heavy um, chest day um, and I tested your, your pecs, you know, 30 minutes after you'd probably have most things shut down. It's a natural process, muscles shutting down, uh, but they should recover uh, as long as we give our bodies enough rest. And so people who don't give or give, give time to rest and recover. So elite athletes who don't want to stop training, right. But that recovery process, sometimes taking that D load week when we're, when we're lifting or taking that week of, of doing mobility work rather than intense training, uh, really accelerates, you know, our progress fitness wise and keeps our bodies healthy too. That's an interesting point. When you talk about that, sometimes the muscles will shut down right afterwards as just a natural response to initiate recovery, because if recovery needs to happen, then there's a lot of metabolic processes that are happening within that muscle to create recovery. There's nutrients that need to get in there, right? There's, uh, we, we gotta, we gotta shuttle proteins back in there. We gotta shuttle, uh, calcium. We gotta shuttle a lot of things back in there to, uh, repair the muscle. And so it makes sense that it would shut the muscle down or kind of create a dimmer switch where we're turning the, the firing down a bit so that we aren't, um, uh, using it as much because we need to recover. Uh, that, that, that's a fascinating point. Um, one of the things I'm curious about, uh, pain brings up a lot of emotion and sometimes it's vice versa, right? Pain brings emotion, emotion bring, brings pain. Uh, it, it can go either way. When you're working on reactivating some of these muscles and getting people out of pain, what are some of the the, the uh, most common manifestations of emotion that are tied to it? Um, as far as the emotions of after getting muscles activated, you're saying? Yeah, or when people come in to see you, are they exhibiting emotion ahead of time? Are they carrying emotion with them? Like whether it's after the fact or before, what, what's being, what emotions are tied to all of this? 
Yeah, there's a lot. Um, I mean, when people come in, I mean, our clinic is unique, I think, because patients have tried a lot of things before they come in to see us. Um, I'd say kind of the classic story of a patient is, um, you know, I, I went, like I got hurt. I saw my primary care doctor. He gave me a muscle relaxer. Uh, didn't help. So I went and saw my orthopedic who did an MRI. Everything looked fine. Um, so he told me to go to physical therapy. Uh, I did physical therapy for eight weeks. Um, I got a little bit better, but I still can't do the things that I want to do. Yeah. And so by that point, they've they've done, you know, eight, 12 weeks of the runaround to try to figure out what the heck's going on with their body. As far as the medical doctor is concerned, they say they're fine. The physical therapist uh, while it's effective for a lot, you know, don't get me wrong, physical therapy is great um, in a lot of instances. Uh, we just tend to see the people who have already tried that. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, by the time they come to see us, they're frustrated, right? They're uh, and they're kind of beaten down. Most people, um, myself included, um, I'm a I'm big into playing tennis, for example. And if I have to take weeks off of playing tennis, then I'm like super depressed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like not Takes away not your therapy. good, right? Yeah. yeah, exactly. It takes away the things that I want to do. I can't go to the gym. I can't work out. If I can't be active, um, then it's hard to it's hard to function in other aspects of my life, right? Yeah. And that's a lot of people that we see. I mean, our patient base is is typically very active. We don't see as many couch potatoes because um, usually I tell them just to go move. <laughs> yeah. um, but it's usually people who are who are active and who are in pain. Um, who have already who've already had the pain for a long time. And so when they come to see me, they're frustrated, they're eager, they want to get back to activity. Um, yeah, but sometimes they're just in a lot of pain. Um, and then when we start testing muscles too, if there's a painful area, I mean, it's not too uncommon to have tears. <laughs> uh, sometimes when we test muscles, it's painful. Yeah. Uh, cause now I'm isolating, I'm putting their body in very vulnerable positions, uh, where, you know, normally that patient's not willing to lift their arm. They haven't lifted their arm like that in, in two weeks because of, it's too painful. And now I'm having them lift it. And not only are they lifting it, I'm pushing on it <laughs> in that position and, and it's super painful. And so as we test muscles and as we find a, and identify, um, areas of, of dysfunction, you know, the process can be pretty painful and, um, and the activation process is also kind of painful too. When mm -hmm. I, when we activate muscles, I'm not, we're not, we, you know, it's not light touch um, by any means. It's, it's relatively deep tissue um, type stimulation. And, you know, we've had, I've had tears on the table from, and lots of swear words too, from, <laughs> uh, from people who are, who are getting muscles activated. But, nice. you know, the cool, the coolest thing is going from a patient who has so much pain lifting their arm or, you know, they need their other arm to even help them get it up. And by the time we're finished, uh, not only can they lift it up, but they have no pain and they have no pain with resistance either. And so um, we see pretty dramatic improvements just, just like that. And it's not that uncommon. Um, not everyone comes in who's that severe, but um, if people don't have true structural damage to an area. So if, you know, if you've, if you got a fully blown rotator cuff, um, I'm likely going to send you out for surgery, right? I'm not going to try to, we're yeah. not going to do a ton of work on you. Yeah. But if if you've already had an MRI and the doctor's just saying you're fine, but you can't figure out why you have so much pain just to move, um, then the results are pretty dramatic for people who are in a lot of pain. And I mean, people, we give people their lives back, you know, um, you know somebody who hasn't played a, their sport for two years because they just were tired of getting hurt. I mean, um, I've had you know, people who play basketball and say, I just stopped playing basketball because I was tired. I'd rather uh, not play than be in pain. And so mm -hmm. I just haven't played. And then we can kind of, we can kind of give those aspects of their lives back the active parts that they've been missing. And, and yeah, it makes a, it makes a world of difference for somebody's quality of life. They become more vibrant when uh, they're doing the things that they want to do. Right. And, and when they can't do those things, it uh, takes that vibrancy away. Right. Right. Yeah, that's, uh, I, and, you know, I love how you talked about a couple of points there. The The first one is, if somebody comes in with a rotator cuff, you're going to refer them out, right? You're going to, you're going to say, hey, this isn't the right thing for you. Or if somebody comes in and they're just not active and they're not 
moving, then you tell them to go move because that's the thing that they need to be doing. And I think that's an important piece. Uh, you know, I, I got frustrated years ago. Uh, if I would go to a doctor and then they would say, oh, you're fine. I'd walk out of there. I'm like, yeah, I'm not. There's something wrong with me. And you're just incompetent. Like, that's what it boils down to. Yes, you have a medical degree. Yes, you went to a lot of school. And yes, you charged me a shit ton for this appointment. You're just incompetent with what's going on. And over the years, I found which doctors knew how to address the different things and which practitioners knew how to address the different things that I needed. And so I love when you talk about that, you know, what your techniques and what your scope works for and what you're going to refer out to. Um, the other point I want to make sure that we, we really highlight is that the process of going through and activating these muscles, it really doesn't take a lot of time. It might be a little bit painful, but the results are immediate. You, you literally feel the activation. You have better function as soon as it's over. Um, how long does it typically take? If I come in with a shutdown muscle, how long are you typically working on somebody to activate that particular muscle? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it kind of depends on the chronicity of the of the injury or how long, how long the muscle's been shut down for. So we kind of talked about how if a muscle's been shut down for years or if it's been a kind of a chronic injury, um, it takes a little bit longer. We're incorporating a lot of these different, you know, acupuncture points as part of the treatment. There's a lot kind of involved. Yeah. Um, the, the cool thing, though, is that if you've got an athlete, and this is where I'd say the muscle activation is probably the most powerful. Um, if you've got an athlete and they they did something, they tweaked their back, they, they hurt their knee or their hip, again, structurally things look good. Um, and they come in and they're coming in limping or they can't put pressure or weight on the area. Um, if it's been within a couple of weeks, um, typically I, we can activate four or five muscles in a matter of about 15 minutes. Um, okay. Because Interesting. when it's a recent injury, we don't have to incorporate any sort of energetic treatment with it. We can work on the muscle only. And it's been short enough time where we can just remind the brain where these muscles are and it can start firing and firing them again. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the cool thing about this technique is that we can get people back playing uh, their sport almost immediately. I mean, we'll have people who their doctor said six weeks, we get them back in one week. Um, yeah. Because as long as things are structurally sound, but they have a lot of pain, like a muscle strain, that's not torn, right? Or something like that, then we can, if it's been recent, I can, we can get people back, um, you know, almost, almost instantly. Our the group I work with, we, we have a contract with BYU athletics. So the whole BYU athletic department, um, which, which is, is a, I've tried a, not to hold that against you for a long time. Um, <laughs> we're trying to get into other places. It's just, uh, you we'll know, get you into, we just need to get you into the right school. Yeah. The, uh, yeah. Right. Not that place down South, but we'll, we'll get you into the uh, well, University of Utah. We're, we're working on that one too. Trust great, me. Great. <laughs> But it's, uh, you know, athlete care, right? It's, it's somebody can come and, and, and get hurt and get treated one time or two times and, and you can get back on the field playing and have significantly less missed time. I mean, in any sport, uh, there's a huge correlation with success that a team has in a season and, and how many injuries that they've had. If, if you're, if you have a high injury, injury rate with your, with your team, um, the chances of you going far in the playoffs or winning anything is, is low, right? But the team yeah. who stays healthy typically are the, is the team that withstands um, the challenges throughout the, throughout the season and, and gets and gets back. Um, now, if it's not a recent injury, if it's been if it's been a lot longer, like what we work on with you, um, then it's going to take me about 15 minutes per muscle to activate. Mm. And but honestly, we can work on as many muscles in a visit as we want to. So as long as we've got time, I can we can do six eight muscles. Um, it's a, it's a big chunk of time. It's kind of, it's, you know, relatively painful for the body to kind of do all of that in one session, but, but we can, and then usually sometimes the result is immediate or sometimes because I, I beat up the muscles a little bit, there's some soreness that lingers for a few days. Um, but usually the result is fairly, is fairly quick. Everybody's body is going to respond differently. And the thing with pain is that there are so many other factors that could be complicating it um, that we don't see, right? So if you come in with pain and we find five muscles shut down, I what I don't know is that all five of these muscles are the only thing contributing to your pain. 
Mm. So that's kind of the thing that that we don't always know. And so um, that's where our chiropractic adjustment comes in, right? We need to make sure that joints are mobile. Yeah. Um, we have other therapies that we do. I, I do dry needling um, for people. We do um, movement therapies like um, like McKenzie therapy. It's a it's called MDT. It's yeah. all about movement and trying to make sure that our bodies and our joints have proper range of motion. So there's a lot of factors within pain, and just because a muscle shut down is not does not necessarily mean that that's the only only reason why you're in pain or the only reason that you have weakness or the only reason you have some sort of dysfunction. It's just part of the puzzle. That's why, like I'm saying, you know, my favorite patient is somebody who can pinpoint their injury, right? Because then I pretty well know if you were fine before the injury, there's only a few things that it could really be. And more than likely, it's it's muscle. And so yeah. those are the type of people that I'd say success rate is extremely high. People who have pain from other things usually just takes kind of a combination of different therapies to get people better. Uh, but the muscle activation is always kind of the first go-to because if muscles aren't stabilized, then the rest of the body has a hard time adapting to other treatments. So if I put needles into a trigger point, a tight muscle, if another muscle is not working, more than likely that muscle that's tight is tight because of an imbalance. So we've got to balance yeah. out the body first. And then if that muscle is still tight, then the dry needling or whatever therapy we wanted, we decided to apply ART and whatever it is, is going to be a little bit more effective in order to, uh, to take care of that dysfunction. And it does take a few modalities sometimes to get that. I, I know as I've come in, uh, we did some muscle activation and then a little bit of dry needling and um, adjustment. I remember one time I I don't know what I had done, but there was something that was locked up in my ankle and you adjusted my ankle and my foot. And then immediately I feel everything just turned back on. It's like in my, my, uh, calf, my tib, my feet, like I just felt more stable. I went out for a run, uh, you know, went to the gym. Everything was stronger. I was more stable. It, I, we didn't even do any activation. It was just the opening up of the joint that made a, made a huge difference there. So I love how you're talking about the, the different modalities need to be there relative to the issues that uh, that people are having. Well, Dr. Danielson, right, so we're... We, yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah, sorry. I was just going to say, you know, we, 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 we do emphasize the muscle activation, right? That's kind of the primary thing that we do. Yeah. But, yeah, you know, we, we try to make sure that you know, within... Within our scope, I mean, as a chiropractor, we can do a lot of different things. And, and if, all, if the, if the muscle activation is the truly the only thing that I know how to do, um, I get a lot of people better, but there's still that piece that's missing. And so there's just a lot of other, other, other things to consider with pain and with injury. Yeah. I love that. Well, we're coming up on our time and I've, I've got a couple of other, uh, last minute questions just, uh, about your growth and evolution that I want to make sure that we get through. Uh, we could talk all day about this and I mean, it, it's amazing. I look down at the time and I think, holy cow, this time has flown by. Uh, so we're definitely going to have to have you back on to talk more about this. And for our listeners that are wondering why you haven't heard from my co-host, uh, apparently the weather is not great where he's at and he lost signal. He texted me and, uh, he was, he felt bad that he had to drop off and could not get back on uh, for the rest of this episode. So uh, anyway, Dr. Danielson, um, what is, uh, what's something right now that you're most proud of? It's a great question. I think for, you know, for myself, um, you know, I'd say with, with what I do with my work, I'm, I'm proud of what I do with my work. I, uh, I give a hundred percent to every single patient. And I think, um, you know, when it comes to learning, I'm hungry for knowledge. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm never satisfied with what with what I already know. And so I'm currently getting trained in another technique therapy. I mean, I'm I'm always Very trying cool. to do something. And so I think that that's that's the one thing that I kind of pride myself in, at least, is I truly try to be as thorough with every patient. I try to give the best possible care to every single patient. And you know, because of that, it kind of breaks my heart if I do have somebody who doesn't quite respond <laughs> the yeah. way that I am expecting it to, because yeah. I, I, I give what I can. But um, I'd say for myself, yeah, I, I have a lot of I take a lot of pride in the in trying to provide really quality um, care to every single person. I love that. Who's inspiring you right now? Oh, you know, I uh, honestly, I'm I'm not even. I'm not even in the world of listening to inspirational people right now, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, 
family life has gotten hectic where it's it's family and it's, and it's work right now. Um, but honestly, I'd say, I don't know, somebody who's inspiring me would just be, um, you know, probably all the people who are, who are kind of taking me through um, these different technique systems that I'm doing. I mean, I try to take inspiration from, from each person that I, that I, that I communicate with and try to take, you know, learn something from every single person. Awesome. I love that. I, it, you know, it takes time to, for people to grow and evolve. Uh, if there's one simple habit that you'd like our listeners to take on and they only do one thing that they started today, what would that be? Uh, move more. Um, I think 90% of, of people don't move enough. Um, and the movement aspect of things, it's, it's super simple. I think people think they have to go to the gym for an hour a day. Um, honestly, it's just moving our bodies. It's amazing how many people feel better just when they move, how many injuries just get better uh, just by moving our bodies, um, how much pain um, gets better. A quick side note on, on pain, when we don't move, our pain receptors in our joints actually increase. So oh, our, those, those, re, those receptors are heightened in during inactivity. Wow. Um, and movement usually calms those down. There's an inverse reaction between a movement receptor, which is called a mechanoreceptor, and also a pain receptor, which is called a nociceptor. And inactivity shuts, kind of hushes the mechanoreceptors because we're not moving those movement receptors. Mm -hmm. And whenever that happens, pain receptors always increase. And so people who don't move enough typically are in a little bit more general pain yeah, because those okay. receptors are heightened. So the more that we move, uh, the more those movement mechanoreceptors start, start raising and it hushes those pain receptors a little bit more. And it can be just as simple as, yeah, if you're sitting at a desk, stand up and, and take a, take a walk for five minutes every hour. Or if you're used to sitting, maybe kneel or maybe stand or change mm -hmm. your position, do something, yep. um, you know, do some stretches, do a little bit of yoga, whatever it is, get your joints and your muscles moving. And a lot of times we just start feeling better. Wow. That's amazing. I didn't, I didn't understand that about the, the inverse relationship, but I can see that in my own life. If I, the more I move, the healthier I feel, uh, the less pain I have, uh, in general, right. Physically and emotionally, uh, because if I'm moving, uh, life gets put into perspective very quickly. So that's a great tip. Uh, and on that note, folks, it is time for us to wrap up another episode of the Evolve podcast. I want to thank our guest, Dr. Uh, Danielson, for coming on and my co-host, W. Miles Riley, for joining us before he got kicked off. Uh, at Dr. Danielson, what is the best way for people to uh, connect with you and either learn more or get uh, more information about how they can get uh, uh, therapy with you? Yeah, so uh, one probably the best way is probably through like LinkedIn. Uh, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, I don't, I'm not super active on Instagram, unfortunately, but um, I'm based here out of Utah near Salt Lake and work for a company called Muscle Works Chiropractic. And so that is, you know, that's the organization we're, we're with BYU and we, um, we, that's, that's the main way. If you want to find me, it's through Muscle Works or through, through LinkedIn. Great. Love that. And we'll put some uh, links in the show notes as well so people can get a hold of you. Well, Dr. Danielson, once again, thank you for coming on. And hey, folks, remember that it does take time and consistency to evolve. But first, you have to disrupt. And now it's time for you to get out there and evolve. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Evolve Podcast. Follow us on your favorite podcast app. And if you haven't done so, please give us a rating. As an independent podcast, it really helps us get more reach. This podcast is part of our mission to help millions of people evolve into the best versions of themselves. Please check out our coaching services at evolve-cast.com or pick up some of our Evolve merch. Until next time, keep evolving.